and welcome to yet another episode of The Diplomat Couch, where we profile ambassadors, UN representatives, and heads of international missions. And also, we look at the organizations and the work that they're doing in Zimbabwe. On today's episode, we've got the ambassador of Ghana to Zimbabwe, His Excellency Alexander Grant and Trago. Welcome to The Diplomat Couch. Thank you. On the 6th of March, Ghana celebrates um, its independence. So can you give us a bit, a bit of a history of the country's road to independence in, in a nutshell? Thank you. I think uh, uh, you'll be aware that uh, Ghana was the, the first uh, sub-Saharan African country to have attained independence after so many years of uh, colonization by the British uh, regime. Uh, before the British were other uh, instances of interaction with the Portuguese, with the Dutch, with the uh, Spaniards and uh, what have you. But on that fateful day, after so many struggles, Ghana attained independence on the 6th March 1957 to make it the first country in the sub-Saharan Africa, Africa to attain independence. Okay, so 1957, that makes it how many years of independence? About uh, 66, 66 years now. 66. Congratulations Thank on you. your 66th anniversary. And then your country has faced some instability in, in its founding years, but over the decades, Ghana has become one of the most peaceful countries in, in Africa. Have, how have you ma managed to maintain this peace over the years? Uh, thank you. Um, I think it all started from uh, the way we uh, uh, our independence started. Our first president, he came out with a policy of making sure that our educational system is not uh, limited to certain communities. Mm -hmm. So somebody from the north can go to school in the south, uh, a Muslim can go to sc a Christian school, a Christian can go to a Muslim school. Mm -hmm. And we cohabited in boarding houses. So growing up, our culture was I mean, we, we learned to, uh, how to live with each other mm -hmm. and how to understand each other's culture. And that has been very key in maintaining peace and stability in Ghana. And so if you look at our political dispensations, any time uh, we have a president who is a Christian, his vice is a Muslim. And any time we have a president who is a Muslim, the vice is a, a, a Christian. Just to make sure that we uh, bring about our cultures and religion to cohabit, and that is what has made the trick. And then our commitment and desire to maintain peace and stability in our country, mm -hmm. yeah, has led us to this democratic dispensation that we are enjoying now. And then shifting to the economy of Ghana, it's been impressive in the past few years. What can you attribute to this impressive economic growth over the years? It is the programs and policies that our governments have adopted over the years. And then, look, uh, the programs and policies are synced with the natural resources that we have. And then the investment uh, policies that uh, we also uh, put in place. If you look at Ghana, our location, accessibility is key. Eight hours or six hours, you are in Europe. If somebody wants to fly to Ghana, same day the person is there. And then, apart from accessibility, uh, you look at the uh, market size of the region. If you do investment in Ghana, it's a gateway to the West Africa because of the free movement of goods and services in the West Africa sub-region. We have a market population of about 380 million people. And so if somebody invested in uh, Ghana, it's like investing in West Africa. And then apart from that, there are also investor guarantees that the government puts in place for those who show interest in investing in Ghana. And there is this government's uh, uh, public and private part, uh, participation in investment ventures. Mm -hmm. So partnerships are always there and the private sector has also been encouraged uh, to, 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 to operate in an environment that is free so that they can also help the economy to stand on its feet. So we see the private sector as the, in, uh, the uh, uh, engine of growth. And so government do uh, encourage, uh, take pragmatic steps to encourage the uh, private sector to, step, uh, to stand on their feet. 
Okay. And so besides what you've mentioned, the policies with private sector, the location of Ghana, what are the sectors that are driving the economy of Ghana? Ghana is second producer of cocoa in the whole world. And then we are, in terms of mining, we are second producers of gold in Africa. We are second to South Africa. We have manganese, we have bauxite, and we are an oil-rich country now. So we export crude oil also. And apart from that, we have huge uh, reserves of natural gas. And Ghana, as we speak, uh, is now self-sufficient. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say self-sufficient. At least 40% of our gas consumption is produced locally. And so you look at the mining sectors, the agri sector, and then the manufacturing sector, they are uh, working hand in hand to boost our economy. Okay. And then you briefly mentioned um, private sector and the encouragement that the government has given. But what are the incentives and opportunities for foreign investors in Ghana? Foreign investors, that was the more reason why I mentioned the uh, investor guarantees. Mm -hmm. So that when an investor comes to uh, uh, do business in Ghana, one, what determines the interest is the political stability, the democratic dispensation that we have in Ghana mm -hmm. itself is an enough incentive to attract an investor to Ghana. And then we have made sure that our judicial system is also very effective so that when somebody comes to invest in Ghana and for one reason or the other uh, the person encounters any problem, the adjudication of the issues will not delay to the extent that it will discourage other people from coming to Ghana. And then the guarantees provides an opportunity for investors to even repatriate their profits and dividends. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, bringing in foreign currencies and all those things, the, the, the systems are put in place in such a way that you wouldn't have to struggle before you bring resources into the country, especially in the forest uh, 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 sense. Thank you, Your Excellency, for giving that insight about Ghana. When we return in our second segment, we shall discuss bilateral relations between Ghana and Zimbabwe. Hello and welcome to our second segment of today's episode of The Diplomatic Couch. My name is Osli Matsikenyeri and today we're joined by His Excellency, the Ambassador of Ghana to Zimbabwe, um, Alexander Grant Ntrakwa. We were discussing the Ghanaian um, economy earlier in the first segment, and then now we come to the Ghana and Zimbabwe bilateral relations. Can you give us a, a, a bit of a history or how the relationship is currently? Uh, whenever we talk about Ghana-Zimbabwe relations, it excites me because uh, Ghana and Zimbabwe were in the forefront of liberation struggles in Africa. And... Um, Ghana, playing the lead role at a point, uh, received some of the liberation uh, leaders from other parts of Africa, of which were, uh, uh, well, I can just mention one person, President uh, Robert Mugabe, came to Ghana to teach and did not only teach and make sure that he came back to Zimbabwe with a, a Ghanaian <laughs> wife. So, that is how strong the relation between the two countries are. And so from uh, independence, Ghana was among the first countries to establish diplomatic presence in Zimbabwe. In 1991, we even signed uh, uh, an agreement for PJCC, on uh, Permanent uh, Joint Commission for Cooperation. Unfortunately, uh, it became dormant. There was no activation between the two countries. But since 2015, uh, my predecessor, initiated action and started in, the mission started engaging with the foreign ministry and but for the uh, uh, global pandemic uh, that COVID that came up uh, I'm sure they would have been able to sign the, the agreement again for us to start the engagement since I came uh, the conversation has still continued as we speak uh, the general cooperation for agreement uh, uh, general cooperation agreement is ready for signature. The Memorandum of Understanding for Tourism is also ready uh, for signature. We have about three or four MOUs that are still under consideration. And as we speak, there's still the engagement between this mission and the Foreign Ministry uh, as to the way forward to make sure that we translate 
the bond of friendship existing between Ghana and Zimbabwe into tangibles in terms of trade and investment, in terms of tourism, in terms of Greek agriculture, in terms of education, in terms of mining, in terms of aviation. These are areas that the two countries have strong potentials that we can uh, 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 exploit. But uh, as we speak, we have not been able to do that, which saddens some of us. Yeah. And you've mentioned that there is potential and at the moment there hasn't been. Can you put a value to the trade between the two countries? Unfortunately, the trade is almost next to nothing. We don't have any goods and services flowing between the two countries. Even if it comes to investment, the only two that I know of from the Ghana side uh, 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 were uh, First Capital uh, Plus, which was a microfinance institution established by a Ghanaian here. Uh, we had the license and then established it here, but it collapsed somewhere along the line. The same, the proprietor of the same company also set up Jinyame uh, uh, Resources. It's a mining uh, entity. Unfortunately, that one also collapsed. And so there are no Ghanaian investments as we speak in Zimbabwe. Would you know the reason why? Uh, that is uh, what amazes me because uh, it looks like we haven't engaged enough and uh, we haven't opened ourselves up to each other enough. Uh, now that we have this African Continental Free Trade Secretariat in Ghana, and uh, President Managagwa to uh, made a, 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 a eloquent statement on it when he was at the AU, it's, it gives me hope that now we have come to appreciate the fact that uh, we have to trade among ourselves. And so we will take ad advantage of these dispensations or the windows that are open for us because of the Secretariat to engage closely. I know uh, Zimbabwe has been sending uh, um, uh, business uh, experts to Ghana of late. We you know we don't enjoy any visa regime, so any Zimbabwean can travel to Ghana at, without taking a visa. Ghanaians also can come, and I know some experts have gone to Ghana to survey our market, and uh, we are also encouraging our people in Ghana to also do the same, so that when we kick start, uh, we will not have to delay any further. And having spent time in Zimbabwe, how would you encourage Ghanaian business people, investors who want to come to Zimbabwe, what would you say about Zimbabwe? In fact, uh, only last week I even uh, received one businessman who happened to be a very good friend of mine. Anytime I invited him to come to Zimbabwe, uh, he was dragging his feet. His focus was always on Rwanda. He was going there uh, from time to time. So this time around, he was in Rwanda. I said, why don't you pass by? I don't need to get a visa before you come. Then he came. He was shocked at what he saw in Zimbabwe. The opportunity. And he realized, he trusts me that for him, wherever he goes, his vision, his mindset, his thought are all business, business, business. And he saw Zimbabwe as a virgin land for investment. And that gives me hope that somebody like that, when he goes back and starts, uh, uh, starts conversing with, uh, with his business colleagues, mm -hmm. he will give them the, uh, uh, the true picture on the ground. He, his statement was that they, had, uh, they have been misinformed mm -hmm. by some media houses. And then on a lighter note, do you, uh, how many Ghanaians are resident in Zimbabwe currently? Unfortunately, uh, we are not as many as one would have wished. Uh, we are just around 100, if I should uh, put 100. it that way. And uh, out of the 100 or more, uh, as maximum will be about 120. Okay. A lot of them are people who are aged, who came here so many years ago uh, to teach, uh, to work in the health services and what have you. The rest are involved in the, uh, these international organizations here. And then uh, we have the young ones who are also in the non-formal uh, sector. We, ha we have some, quite a few of them who were footballers and students who are also schooling here. And Zimbabweans in Ghana, any ideas? Not, not that I can place a finger on, but I can say that our numbers here may be more than your numbers in Ghana. Yeah. Thank you for that. And when we return, we are going to get a bit more personal with the ambassador and discuss his time in Zimbabwe and his history as a diplomat. <music> Thank you.
Welcome to the third and final segment of the Diplomat Couch. And today we have been graced by His Excellency Alexander Grad Tragwa, who is the ambassador of Ghana to Zimbabwe. And now we discuss a bit about your personal life. Who is Ambassador Tragwa? Where were you born, educated, and where did you grow up? Ambassador Grand Alexander Grant in Trakwa is a son of farmer, a farmer and a businessman and uh, was born in a village in the western region of Ghana, even though I don't come from that place, but my father settled there. And then schooled um, in the rural area like that, so I didn't have uh, the opportunity of uh, going to one of the elite schools in Ghana. So I did my elementary school in the village and came to another secondary school, also a rural school called uh, uh, Insaba Presbyterian Secondary School. And then from there, I did my sixth form education with, uh, at uh, Swedro Secondary School, which is also um, semi-rural. Uh, and then uh, uh, moved on to University of Ghana to do uh, my first degree in political science uh, and minor in psychology. Then I joined the foreign service. Uh, before I joined the foreign service, I joined the civil service of Ghana and was posted to the office of the president. So I started my career right from the citadel of power, the office of the president. Went there for about two years and I uh, got uh, transferred to join the, mini, uh, uh, the foreign service. Uh, so since 1997, I uh, was in the foreign service. 97, I went back to school to do uh, my masters at the University of Ghana again in the international relations. Then I came back and I was posted after four years at base to Berlin. So Berlin was my first posting. So I did four years from 2000 to 2004 in Berlin, came back to Ghana and did another four years at home, uh, serving in various bureaus in the ministry. And then my next posting, before I went on my next posting, I had the opportunity to go to Oxford University uh, to uh, do a nine months post uh, uh, graduate uh, program in diplomacy. So you can imagine somebody from a rural area, a village man going to Oxford. to Oxford. It was a huge privilege for me. Came back and I was posted to New York, uh, our mission in New York. So I was the head of administration, which we normally call head of chancery. And then at the same time on the administrative and budgetary committee of the United Nations. So we were discussing the budget for the UN, uh, the whole UN system. I did four years there, came back to Ghana, and uh, in 2015, I was made the director of passports in Ghana. And uh, whilst there, uh, I brought about a lot of innovations, the online passport applications and what, what have you. And then in uh, 2017, I was posted to Geneva. I was supposed to serve four years in Geneva. So from 2017, I was supposed to go back to Ghana in 2021. Just before I would go back to Ghana, I got the appointment to come to Zimbabwe as the ambassador. So I just had to pack my things in Switzerland, put them home, and then continue to Zimbabwe. So I have been here since January 2021. Yeah. And uh, when you were posted here, uh, how have you, how has been your tenure in Zimbabwe? How have you found Zimbabwe? Uh, I was amazed when I got here. I enjoy the greens I see all over. Mm. And I enjoy the hospitality of Zimbabweans. And for me, for the fact that I know I am with my in-laws, that makes me feel at home. And so I go out freely and interact freely. And whenever I go somewhere and somebody is trying to be, uh, trying to maybe show off a bit, I say, hey, be careful. You are dealing with your in-law. <laughs> so you better behave. And that alone settles the matter. I enjoy the food, the salsa. I enjoy a lot and the tourist attractions here. I haven't done all, but at least I have been to Nyanga, I've been to Gweru, and above all, I've been to Victoria Falls. And I've done the zip line. In Victoria Falls? I started the zip line from Rebo Towers, uh -huh. they continued at uh, Nyanga, and then graduated at Vic Falls. <laughs> 
and uh, I've been to Gweru to interact with some of the animals there and take pictures with uh, the lions and uh, feeding. I even interacted with the elephants, feeding the elephants and all. And because of the potential I saw in Victoria Falls, I connected the mayor of Victoria Falls with Cape Coast, uh, one of our uh, 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 municipal assemblies in Central Region. Because of the tourism potential of Cape Coast and the, the tourism to potential of uh, Victoria Falls, we are still working on the possibility of having a twin city arrangement. You know, Ghana in December, uh, Cape Coast, uh, we have this year of return and the year of, uh, we, we always change the names every Christ, uh, December. And it attracts almost uh, between 1.5 to 2 million diasporians to Ghana. And the reason why we want to get these two uh, uh, sister cities to work together is that when they are coming to Ghana, for instance, if we have that bilateral arrangement, the package can be done to link them up to Victoria Falls. So you come to Ghana and spend the Christmas and everything, either you come to Victoria Falls before you come to Ghana, or you come to Ghana on your way back, you come and have a stint at uh, Victoria Falls. And by so doing, the revenue will not be limited to Ghana alone. And Victoria Falls and Zimbabwe will also have its share. And that is one key thing that I want to make sure it materializes before I leave here. And you, now that you've mentioned the December pilgrimage yes. to Ghana that happens, I've seen it on social media, it's now become such a big thing. It's a big thing. Why do you think that has happened? What has Ghana done to encourage such tourism? You know, uh, because of the uh, time limits, we were unable to delve into the history of Ghana the way we should have. Be the Ghana is doing this because of its uh, history with slave trade, at, uh, Atlantic slave trade, and the forts and castles that we have in Ghana because of the slave uh, trade. Uh, UNESCO has identified 32 of them as uh, World Heritage uh, Sites. And so you can imagine uh, why our African Americans in the diaspora will want to trace their roots, come and look at the tree, uh, slave roots right from the northern part of Ghana the routes that their ancestors uh, traveled on, the rivers where they stopped to take their shower and then uh, drink and then continue to the castles at the coast and to the point of no return where they will be put in the ships and, uh, and uh, uh, ferried across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it has, we have managed to brand it in a way that people are so keen in coming to Ghana to experience it at first hand. They go into the dungeons and they can still smell the sweat of humans in there. And when they come, you see people weeping when they travel along the route. And some of them have money to trace their routes to Ghana. Rita Mali has uh, now uh, relocated to Ghana, has a house and everything there. Yeah. Now, thank you very much, um, Ambassador, Your Excellency. It's been a pleasure having thank you, you on the show. Thank um, you too. You've heard what Ghana is doing and what we can learn and the relationship that Ghana has with Zimbabwe. It's been a pleasure having you on The Diplomat Couch. Catch you on the next episode. <laughs>